Well, it's it's two o'clock, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'll start by just saying that um, this is this is the most complicated individual grant that there is. And so, if this if you haven't written another grant and you're trying to write this one first, it is difficult. But I will say that if you do write it, it is going to be something that will prepare you for um, the future. And um, first of all, before I even get to talking about going through my PowerPoint, and the PowerPoint is, was written to be an independent study course. So you'll see it's very text heavy and there's lots of links. So I'm gonna be going through it, but I won't be going through every section of it. And it's really intended for you to take it afterwards when you're ready to write the grant or ready to think about the grant and going through the different parts. The second caveat I have to make is that um, this the NIH every year updates all of their forms and the new update just came out um, at the end of October and I'm in the process of redoing all of my materials into the form H update. So this particular course and all the links are for form G. So sometime in the next week or two, they'll be all updated, but it'll be the same links. It just goes into the, the new forms. But you, I don't think anyone here who's, um, if you're a first year postdoc will be Hi, come on in. I'm just getting Ooh. started with me writing the grant um, for the very next due date, which is in G uh, January. So by the time you be getting ready to, to write it, everything will be um, completely updated. I'm going to go first of all, because otherwise I'm going to forget and show you um, my toolkits. And I will drop this into the chat, but also I'm sure that um, Blake can go ahead and, and uh, all of this is completely available for any postdoc that's here. So I wanted to you see that I have the K99 Rue postdoc, but I'm going to go back up to the right before I have a postdoc grant toolkit. I just want you to know this is available. I did a there's a seminar that I did last last year that is a video that you can look at that talks a little bit more about some of the other toolkits, along with the K99 Rue and the F31, which is really more for for generally graduate students. I have um, a postdoc funding list, which is in Excel. And this has just, I think, a couple of hundred different grants that you could look through and see what you might be interested in. And at the top, there are three separate search engines that you could look for for grants. And um, there's some tu tutorials of how to use it. This one is a UCLA postdoc grant toolkit, which is a terrific one just to look through because it lets you actually you know, you are able to put your um, citizenship and, and what you're looking for, and it'll uh, pump out some possible grants for you. So that's a, definitely available for anybody that is interested in doing some grant searches. Um, and then um, I also have some master grant planners and shells, which you could use to personalize your measures. This is a, um, I'll go back to ours today. Um, what we've really done here is to create some tools to help you to plan and write your grants more easily. There's two main tools. One is um, the grant planner. And the grant planner has all the different sections that you need to write for the grant, along with um, links to the different parts of the instructions that you might have. And then this actually tells you the instructions right there, and you can check them off. I'm not opening it up because that will pop into a different uh, window. Uh, so that's the for, and then it tells you the grant writing steps you would need to go through and uh, specific information on that and a to do list. And um, if you were going to write, if you're going to write a K99 group, this will give you a chance to organize everything like in a picture, like a table. And that really is helpful because there's lots of different parts of this grant and you may not be working, you're not going to work just from the top to the bottom. You'll find out. There's certain parts of it that are easy to write early, like some of the parts of this grant um, are things you probably ought to consider doing right now, even though you may not be at all close to writing, like making your bio sketch, which if you may already have something like that, if you just got hired, you had a CV that you wrote, and the bio sketch is similar to that. And in at NIH and soon at NSF, they're going to require that the bio sketch is made through something, uh, a website called SciNCV. And it's um, an NIH sponsored website. You upload all your information onto it, all your publications. In fact, it'll find publications for you. And then when you're ready to do your grant, you um, click the different buttons and it pops out the, the, the bio sketch, which is your CV for a, uh, for a grant. And it has it all ready for you. So that's something, that's one thing I would emphasize in grant writing is that there's a lot of parts that you could do far ahead of time. And then if you have all those things done, it's much easier when you get to the point where you're actually writing your narrative of all the things you have to do for the grant. 
So anyway, this you can look through this um, to-do list and many of the grants at NIH, if you do an NIH grant, you're going to be prepared for any other possible grant. And if you do this particular grant, you are definitely going to be prepared for everything else because there's so many different parts, which we'll be doing in just a second. Um, the second thing I have is so that that's a checklist, that Excel planner. But the second main thing I have is um, this grant shell, which is a Word document that allows you to just write everything that you need to write right in, right in the Word document. So again, this is basically some of the same links and information that you would have in the grant planner. I repeat it here. Um, and the reason I repeat some of these is I'm, I'm, I'm imagining what's going to happen is you say to yourself, OK, I have an hour. I'm going to go ahead and work on my um, project narrative. And so and rather than having to spend half an hour trying to find the instructions for the project narrative, you can go straight over here and over in the comments on the side here, if I can get this out of the way. Oh, it's gone. Um, it has all of the instructions that you would hear they are these comments over here will have all the instructions and all the links to the instructions and you could just go into this document look at the instructions and start writing your narrative and make sure you're okay um, also this entire document is in the correct format for NIH and the ones that I have for NSF and other grants are also already formatted for you and just in case you're in case you're concerned about that at the beginning of the document I have um, all the notes about formatting, like what's the type you can use, what's the, you know, whether you use hyperlinks or not, how many pages, and all that kind of stuff. So those are the two main tools, and those are kind of proprietary to Baylor. Um, we usually can't find them someplace else. We've developed them, so you are kind of lucky to be able to have an op option to use those, and you can make them yourself for any grant that you're going to do. It's just a matter of putting in all the different parts. Okay, so that's a pretty a quick overview. The other thing that I have is um, I have every year NIH does conferences. In fact, they're in the middle of doing it now. It used to be you had to pay a lot of money to go to the conference. Um, and I think the registration fees were over $500. But now after COVID, they put everything online and it's all free, which is really wonderful. And then after the conference is over, everything is um, uh, the webinars and the PowerPoints and the transcript are also all free and available. And I have um, downloaded a few, like the K Awards overview is here, but the entire conference is something I can probably give, I can have like sent out to you too. So you can pick and choose something that you'd be interested in looking at. You could also just register for the conference if you want to, and I'll, I'll give you the link for that too. I just gave it to somebody else today. Because this great grant has a lot of extra pieces, um, I have written templates for a lot of things. For example, the mentor statement. One of the really important parts of this grant, it's a mentored grant, which means that you're an early career researcher who's going to get some extra mentoring. And your mentor has to write what they're going to be doing. And they also have to write, you're an absolutely wonderful person that they've never seen such a wonderful person before. <laughs> and so some uh, mentors may be great at doing that, but a lot of times if you just have them do it, there, they may miss parts that you need to have in it. And so that's what this template is. The green part here it, are the actual instructions. And then I come down and I have a sample of how that could be written. And we usually suggest that you write this or you write it with your mentor. Um, and then it's, it's, it, people are usually very happy if you do their work for them. So if you wrote this up at least, and I usually say, I've written a draft of it just to help you out. And then you can give that to them plus the instructions and they can do whatever they want to uh, finish that out. Um, so those types of templates are here. Now, the one really great part about the K99 RU is it is almost exactly identical to the major career award, which is the K01. Notice they both have a K in there. Um, in fact, the second part of this uh, award, the K01, um, K O O, the K the root or R O O is basically the same as the first three years of the K award. The K award is a five year award. Both awards are just at different stages. The K ninety nine is intended. I'm going to go ahead and go back to my just a second. Back to my power. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Let me go. Um, 
This is what we're going to go. Okay, so this actually shows you in the graph kind of what we're talking about. So these are some different kinds of grants at NIH. Just a very, very quick overview. Um, there are research grants. In fact, I think all of you are working on a research grant that your faculty member has. I believe um, Annie Ginty has an our, uh, she has actually she has a KO1 award. And then she has been working on this RO1, which is like R01 is where you want to go. If you get to an R01, you've made it. Um, and then there's actually one stage beyond the R01, and that's called an R35 Mira. And I'm working with two people in psychology on those, and there's another one in chemistry. And that award is um, not only a large research grant, but it actually is a research grant that says you are so special that I'm not even going to ask you to tell me what you're going to do with the money. I think that you are going to do amazing things with this money, and I'm just going to give you a lot of it <laughs> for five years. And then at the end, if you've done those wonderful things, I'll give you some more for another five years. Whereas the difference between the MIRA and the R01 is that the R01, you have to say exactly what you're going to do with it. Then you have the R03 and the R21s, and those are smaller amounts when you're just getting started and you need to get a little bit of uh, work done before you're ready for an R01. So you're on the other side with this grant, and that's the Fellowship and Career Awards. Notice how many of those awards there are. NIH has a huge investment in trying to train new people for the field. They really do. So um, there are some ones that are give that um, the, a, a university like Baylor would apply for in order to get money so that they could bring people in. But the one that you're working with is a um, one that an individual applies for. It really is just for you. And you can take it if you go someplace else. Although the award money comes to an institution and then is funneled to you. There are a few awards out there that will go just like directly to the individual, like you get it in your mailbox, I guess. <laughs> but because this one does go through the institution, you have to submit the award through Baylor. Baylor is the one that says, yes, everything in this award is correct. Therefore, um, we are we are putting our stamp on it and you can submit it. But the nice part about that is because it's a Baylor sponsored award, you get all the help of the people who administrate that award, which is actually a little bit complicated. So um, you can see that the K99 group is right in the middle here. It is a transitional award. And I think it's really interesting because what it does, and now I'm going to go back to the very beginning I should have started with, is it funds five years, up to five years, one or two years of a postdoc, three years of a tenure track faculty. And that's a little bit of a catch because you can't get the root part unless you also get a faculty position, a tenure track faculty position. However, come on in. Sorry. Um, if you get a K99 route, you are so very um, qualified and very, very competitive for a faculty position. I would be stunned if you couldn't get a faculty position. Now, maybe you won't be able to get it at you know, whatever your, your biggest uh, possibility is, but um, you definitely would be able to, to obtain one. So um, it's an excellent one to go for. But as I told you before, if you were to apply, you only have probably a couple of years that you could apply. So you could apply and maybe reapply because it's a little bit tricky. And this is why it's important to know um, early that you want to do it, because you can only apply when you have no more than four years of postdoctoral experience at the moment you submit it. So if you're on year four, you can't submit, you're too late. If you're on year th two or three, you're just perfect, a perfect time. Especially, I would say year three would be great. You'd submit it once. If you don't get um, accepted, you'll get reviews back that'll say what you need to improve on. So you resubmit it in year four. Then this is the good part. If you resubmit in year four and you still don't get it, but you then go either to another postdoc or you do get a faculty position, then you can take basically what you've done in this grant and resubmit it as a K award as soon as you're a tenure track faculty. So um, now the difference between the two is obviously pretty easy to figure out because when you're a postdoc, you're doing something a little different than what you're going to do as an independent faculty member. You'll be doing some work that is related more closely to the person, the faculty member you're working with. And when you're a, you're a um, independent in the tenure track faculty member, you're doing your own work. So probably going to be some relationship, but there should be kind of a cut. You should be doing something different um, in a different direction. So that part that you write in the grant that tells exactly what you're doing is going to be different. 
But in both cases, you are going to need to have some mentors that will be helping you. And it could end up being the same people you're working with right now. Okay, so that kind of gives you just an overview. Then there are other K awards for like later on that you can get um, to pay if you switch um, careers. Okay, this is what it is. It's a two-phase award, one to two years, at least one year as a postdoc. Um, and then the root phase is up to one to three years. And the amount of support kind of depends on which institution, because NIH has lots of different directorates, and different directorates have different amounts of money. They kind of are sort of separate businesses. And so whichever one you would happen to fall under, and you would be under psych and neuro, although depending sometimes on which um, what kind of work you're doing, there may be a couple, but your, your faculty member would be able to know which one you would go under. Um, then uh, generally, it's around $100,000 a year salary and $30,000 for research support, which would include um, you know, all your supplies and things like that. And then in the faculty phase, the root phase, it's up to two forty nine, dollars and then that would include everything. It's your, your uh, salary as well as research support and other career development activities, because both of these require that you have specific things that you want to learn and in order to make yourself ready for a particular trajectory in your uh, work. Benefits, it's, you know, you get a chance to have more mentorship, you have skill development, and especially enhanced career success. And that um, there's a lot of statistics from NIH. The people who get these awards and the K awards generally tend to be far more successful, successful in their careers. Eligibility, you have to be either a US citizen or a non-citizen that has um, a, a research and clinical doctoral degree, and you have to have the visa status, since I think everyone on the call, I believe, is, is uh, not a US citizen. Um, that has allows you to stay long enough to complete the postdoc phase, which I'm assuming most of you probably would already have. Um, you can't have any more than four years of postdoctoral research experience at the time you submit working at US. Um, you can't have had a faculty level position. I don't know if that would include working outside of the US. I have not checked that if that's part of it. Um, and then in order to go to the root phase, you have to get a tenure track job. But as I said, that probably is not going to be a problem. There are three times to submit each year, and um, it probably takes generally eight to nine. If you submit in February, you'll probably hear your results back about nine to ten months later. Maybe you'll get some preliminary results along the way. So probably you might have a chance to resubmit in um, October, um, but maybe you probably have to wait till that next. So even though there's three dates, you wouldn't be able to submit three times in one year just because it's gonna take you a while to get those back. Um, and there's lots and lots of supportive elements that are different from any other award. Like I think I said at the very beginning, this is the most complicated individual award. There are more complicated awards where you have a team of people, but this one just has lots of different, of different parts. But that's why I have help for you. There's three different kinds. And so trying to decide which kind is, depends on the research you have. Like one is an independent clinical clinical trial required. And this, by the way, is just introduction to NIH grants because most NIH grants have these three categories or at least two of them. The second one would be you don't have a clinical trial. And the third one is basic. They've changed the name. It used to be human studies. Now it's called basic experimental studies with humans. So how many of you work with humans? Okay, just you. you and then I know... Uh, uh, Priyanka does. Um, whether yours is a clinical study is complicated because I've listened to several seminars where people are trying to answer that question and I can't figure it out yet. Luckily, however, I think it's on the next slide. There is a tool right here and you can go through the tool and it will help you decide what it is. And the other thing is you can, um, one of the steps I'm gonna tell you is to contact your program officer and your program officer will be able to help you decide on that too. Um, and it is crucial, of course, to figure out what that is. And um, one of the other things I'll show you in a minute is, I said each of the individual groups, uh, directorates has different specific information they require. So once you figure that out working with your mentor, you'll wanna look at that page and decide what it is that you need to know for your particular grant. Um, there are, here are the differences. I told you the K99 and the RU are basically similar. Here's some differences. I'm not gonna go through them now because you're not working on it. On it. What makes a competitive one? That's the most key. You know, 
how are you going to win this award? And I'm going to say one more time, even if you, if you apply for this, even if you're not super competitive, you're going to get a lot back from it because you're going to learn all the steps of applying for a grant. A lot of people, the smartest researchers I work with are um, ones that understand that this first grant you write is a practice. It's sort of like, rather than being in the baseball game or the football or, the, or soccer game, you, uh, you're you practicing for it, okay? And, and that by itself is really useful. And I, I had to do this with my husband recently because he was, he'd done different grants that hadn't for a while. And I just, he was having trouble just getting through all the different pieces. And I said, once you've done it once, it's so much easier. And that is, I do that with faculty members across the campus. So that's my, if my um, encouragement for you is to make sure that you do, do make a, a trial for that. Um, so what makes it competitive? You have to have one to two years of very specific focus mentoring that's going to teach you something unique, that's gonna make you somebody that um, is unlike most other researchers. So you have to be thinking about that. Um, and I think Annie Ginty is one of my favorites because she did a K award and she was, I forgetting all the different uh, aspects of it, but she was working with someone else who was doing a particular kind of research with monitoring stress. And it was the method, I believe this is right, of the monitoring that was unusual. And she needed mentoring in that so that she was able to then take that, that technique and then apply it in ways that people hadn't applied before. Um, and you want to have those career, however it is you're going to learn this technique has to be very clearly developed in your, you have to have a plan of exactly how you're going to do it. And you have to also explain how those are going to make you a unique person, really competitive for a tenure track position. And you have to plan for transitioning over to that section. So what is it you actually have to do? Um, you have a candidate section and a research plan. This is the, the main part that they're gonna be judged on. There's all kinds of other parts of the grant, but these, the, the candidate section of the research plan is kind of your narrative. It's 12 pages, so you have to do everything in 12 pages. The, all, the other part that's really, really important is these plans and statements of the mentor and co-mentors, which together is six pages. And then any, if you have some collaborators, contributors, consultants, and there's definitions of what that is, you have to look that up as you're working through it. That could be another six pages. So this up to um, 24 pages is really what's going to convince them about whether you're the person for this who's going to be awarded or not. And you want those things to mesh, which is why I said on this mentor statement, you, especially if you have two mentors and a lot of people do, you'll ultimately have to have whoever is your main mentor right now at Baylor, if you're writing it here at Baylor, um, would be one of your mentors. But then you're probably going, often going to want a second mentor, which could be here or elsewhere, who's going to teach you something different, something new that, you know, you would not have to have two mentors, but frequently it's useful if you do. And as those people are writing their narratives, you want what they say to be different. Like this person's gonna write about this part of who you are and what they're gonna teach you. And this statement is gonna say something a little bit different and they should combine together in a way that actually supports everything you've already said about yourself in your narrative. Um, who's the, and the, and the other thing I wanna say is that um, you have six six pages where you're really, the difference between this and other awards, like a research award, the research awards are really about the research. And you have to really, really carefully explain the research and be, you know, have that be important enough research. That is also true with this award. However, any of these career awards is also really about you. They, you need to convince them that you are an important person to support for the future. And that's not just true for this particular word. There are, as you go forth in your career, a lot of other career career awards. And it's always important to understand that what they're, what they're giving money for isn't just for that research. It's to, to support you and help you to develop and grow. So you want to promote yourself, which sometimes we're not always comfortable with. And um, so, and you want the, your other letters to support you in that way too, and to say why you're going to be unique. You have to figure out why you're going to be unique. Sometimes I have hard time. Of, how am I unique and different? And that's something you need um, maybe a little help to figure out. Okay. Um, the way it's scored, it's a scale of one to five. And these are the main things that just, the things I just told you about uh, with the addition of this environment and institutional commitment to the candidate, 
which is by your chair and your dean. And it basically it's it's kind of like a facilities page telling what we have here at Baylor. If you have something unique, some unique equipment that we have that you wouldn't have other places that makes this a great place for you to be doing this work. Um, it also, the reason for this is they want to be sure that not only your mentor supports you doing this award, but Baylor is willing to support you doing this award and the chair or the dean. This is another letter that, again, you will probably write most of it and then submit it as a, a draft for that person. And there's very specific requirements. And I also have a template for that one too. And of course, they're very happy to support you because it means you'd have money for two years, one to two years as a postdoc here that no one else has to pay for. So they're, they're definitely happy. You see all these other parts? This is the part that takes a while. Um, but you only have to do them if it require if it's um, relevant for your grant. These are all separate things. So, like if you work with vertebrate animals, you have to do the vertebrate animals page. If you work with biohazards, you have to do that one. If you have select agents that you work with, or um, everyone will have to do other ones, like the training and responsible conduct of research. You would have to do. Um, we actually have someone we've just hired to, that is going to be preparing those sorts of things for you. Um, so it just depends on. Uh, what you're doing. If you're doing a clinical trial, there are more pieces to it. So those are the receipt dates, this is the review, and as I said, it's like nine to ten months that you would know. Um, and if you do a, a new and then you try a resubmission, you can plan on, you probably need about 18 months, but your um, the last submission would have to be when you were more, no more than four years into your postdoc. And so that's what you want to plan. I, and I would say, um, if you decide you want to do this award, you have to talk quickly soon with your, your mentor and probably you know fairly soon with the department chair. And the reason is, it's going to take you some time to do that. And they have to be on board for you to spend the time that you're going to need to do this award. Um, OK, here's quickly going through. OK, here are the steps. Now, I, this is valuable information because these are the steps that um, you have to do for any grant, especially NIH grant. And if you skip some of these, you're not going to work. You're not going to be as competitive. I, I know that's true. Most of the people that work with our office who get grants have done some of these steps. And um, so I just want you to understand what they are. So first of all, you have to read your solicitation down, get my toolkit. Um, but this is the main one that people skip sometimes is doing a search of previous awards. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, here's another step is the way it works at Baylor is the people who submit the words are the university research administrators, and they have a lot of people to take care of here at Baylor. And so they really generally don't work directly with postdocs or with graduate students. However, this particular award, as I said, has to be submitted through Baylor. And so they have to work with you. And the procedure that we, the way we do that, the protocol is that you have your faculty member contact them and say, I have a, I'm approving them to do this award. Will you work with them? And then, then you'll be working more directly with them. And they'll help you get registered, fill out the forms, put your budget together, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Then after you've you know looked at the past, you've got registered, you got everyone on board, you're going to create a one pager, a one page. Half of it will be about you, half of it will be about your research. And you're going to be contacting a program officer to talk to them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, but first of all, I want to talk about how do you search for previous scores? Absolutely key. Absolutely key. I don't care what grant you're doing. You need to find out what did they award? Um, you know, who's the winner? What did those winners do? And is there a winner that's, especially if you find somebody who's really close to what you do, I would then go farther and say, get the name of that person, where they're at, find them, you know, go to their website, wherever you can find it, look them up, look up their papers. What kind, what level of papers do they have? You want to see how competitive you are. That is really, really key for any award. And even if you're not doing all the government websites, make it really easy for you to find other awards. If you're working with a foundation like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, a little bit harder to find stuff. But most of those foundations also have lists and you kind of have to go on their website of like previously awarded grants or highlighted grants. It will help you get a sense for what you need to be writing and what kinds of things appeal to them. That's actually even more important for a foundation because the foundations have like goals that they want to reach. And you can take, and I've had this happen many times, one project that you've written 
and maybe you wrote it for NIH and you didn't get it at NIH, but you take the same project and you go to the American Heart Association, you just kind of tweak it a little bit for heart. <laughs> and then maybe you go to the Cancer Association or you go, you know, so you have to tweak it for whatever the mission of that group is. And that's how people get awards. And I see that happen all the time. Um, so what, what do you do? Uh, luckily, NIH has this NIH report. They're kind of in a, a switching time where they're making it into a whole new fancy website. Um, and you go there and you can do, you can search it lots of different ways. You can search keyword search. You can search, they have this thing called matchmaker, which means you take your, your abstract and you stick the whole thing in there and it'll match you with grants. But you probably are going to want to look specifically at KO1, KO, I said K99, I got it wrong. KO, K99 real words, because that's what you're doing. And so you can actually look straight through for those awards, and then you can look under the certain institute that you know you're going to go in, and they'll all pop up. And then when you click on them, you'll get an abstract of that project. So you'll have an idea of what they did. Okay. So you've already done all that. You've contacted your URA, you're getting set up in the process. You kind of, there's the different awards team that we have. I'm research development. My main job is to help people write grants and to provide these kinds of toolkits and instructions. Um, you may have to go through compliance depending and get an um, IRB or other um, things going on. The university research administrator is the one that's going to help you and they'll help you work with pre-award. Those are the people that have the official authority that they can submit the grants. And then if you get the award, yay, um, the post-award people will help you to actually get your money. Um, you'll consult your department chair, mentors, peers. You want some peers, actually, and I'm glad that you have, we have four or five people here um, because it's really, really helpful if you have people read through your grant, like a lot of people read through your grant. And I would have people read my grant who are other postdocs in whatever field they're in. You, of course, you want people who are in your field to read it. You want your mentor to read it. You want mentors, other faculty members in the department. But I would really strongly suggest you get some people that are friends and um, who are just intelligent people to read your grant. Um, that's actually my, my job. I don't have scientific training specifically, um, and but I can read for clarity and I can read, does it make sense? Does it, can I figure out what they're doing? Even the math ones that I read, I realize I have no, I, I have no idea what he's doing. None, <laughs> zero. But I can read his sentences to see if the sentence is clear. I can see if things are out of place. And that's what you're looking for. That's actually almost, it's a different kind of reading of your grant that's really key. And if you have a spouse or a partner, they can, even if they don't, actually, that's a way to kind of share what you're doing with them too. Let them read it and see what they think about it. And maybe they can help. Um, Let's see. So then after you're doing all these things, you're going to look and decide which one of those you're going to use. And then, oh, I know this is these tables. Once you've decided which one of your solicitations, you need to go and find out what are specific, like say your Institute of Cancer Research. You want to go to the Institute of Cancer Research, which is a link on here, and it'll tell you if there's anything unique for that particular inst institute that you need to do. And then You've written a one page, which is half page of one page, half the page is about you and why you want this grant and why you're unique. The other half of the page is the project that you plan to do. And then you use that and you write a, a, um, a letter, an, an email to the program officer who will be on that previous page. They'll list, list a bunch of them. And my experience has been there's program officers are just like anybody else. Some of them are more organized and some are less organized. Some of them get back to you right away. Some of them take a while. If you don't get an answer right away from someone, it's a good idea to maybe pick somebody else on the list and ask them. But you can kind of ping, if you haven't heard for a week or two, you can ping them again and ask and see. Because sometimes they get busy. And you can imagine you work inside of an academic year and they're, they're faculty members just like your, you guys are. Um, so they have, you know, around Christmas, maybe they're busy and uh, maybe at finals time they're busy, but hopefully they'll get back to you. So you, you write them a letter. This is what I'm doing. Here is who I am. This is what I want to do. And if this is the key. If possible, I'd appreciate a 15-minute phone call. And then you tell them when you're available. 15 minutes seems doable. Frequently, you may very well be on the phone for an hour, you know, if, if, if they like what you're talking about. But they may not call you if you say an hour, <laughs> but they will probably call you if you say 15 minutes. Okay, I think I can, I think I can fit that in between my two classes. 
So that's the, the best protocol we have uh, heard about. And so people often will not do that. The two things people don't do, they don't research previous award grants, like they don't know what the other winners are. And the second thing is they don't contact a program officer because they're nervous. They don't know what to say. Well, generally, the program officers do this all day long, so they know what to say if you don't know what to say. Um, and then here's some questions. And I just like, I write down some questions that I would have that I can ask, like, does my proposal fit the priorities? Is this a good, in, you know, are you the right institute to go to? Um, do you have any advice of how I can do a good proposal? Anything you think is, what do you think is the best of what I've told you so far? And they may ask you more about your project. Um, and then if you have any specific questions about it or suggestions, you know, maybe they have an idea of a kind of training program they see that you're, you actually need in order to go where you want to go. So this grant kind of asks you to figure out where do I want to go? Who do I want to be? What do I want my research to be? So you kind of have to have some idea of that. But you know, it's like I told my, when I was teaching freshman English, you can make things up. <laughs> as long as it sounds good, you can kind of get going on it. Maybe you'll change. So this is everything you need to do with the links to it. Ah! Lots of stuff. I'm not going to go through all these, obviously. Um, this is the checklist of all the different parts you're going to have to do. But some of these things can be done. Some of them are short, like the project narrative is like 30 lines. Um, summary abstract is three lines. These are not big. And I have a guide. If it says guide, that means it's something I wrote that is telling you all the best information about how to do that particular thing. Um, bibliography of references. The nice thing about that, once you have that done, you know, if you use Otero or some of the, if you haven't worked with some of the, um, the library has some classes on how to use different techniques to keep all those um, references together. Um, your bio sketch, again, I said, if you, here's that link to Sci and CD, and I would definitely, that's the very first thing I'd probably suggest somebody do um, before you even get started on your grant, is go to Sci and CD, put up all your, you know, inload all your information on there. Um, within a year, most of the granting agencies are going to require it. They haven't until now, but they're moving in that direction. So it'd be so easy if you have it all there. Um, and then there's these other guides of these institutional parts. These are, remember, these are the two main things, the career development, like who you're going to, oh, I'm sorry, your candidate information, research strategy. And then these are, this is specific aims. It's kind of like an abstract. It's a one pager that says everything in the rest of the grant. So you kind of write that. You can, if you're a person who likes to outline, you could write that first. <laughs> if you're a person who doesn't, can't think of it until you've already written it out and then you pull out, you could do it last. And it depends on who you are. I'm kind of a, one of those last people. So I just already showed you the, the grant planner and the shell that you can use. This tells you how to use the grant planner. It's just a video. I'm not going to go through that. So here's the, the short parts. Um, there's two, kind of almost three sorts of abstracts. One is this project narrative, three sentences. It's for a general public. It'd be what you tell your, your grandma about your project, you know? And actually we suggest sometimes that people start here because if you can explain it in three sentences that anybody can understand, you know what you're doing. <laughs> and I have to tell you, there are many, many faculty members I ask about this and, and they, have, they have a hard time. They have a hard time thinking about it. And this also, especially when you're talking about health, you're doing practical things that will help people. It's actually good to get the feedback of regular people to what you're doing. What do they think about it? My husband's great about this. He tells everybody, this is what I'm doing. And then he gets, and he just takes that feedback to help him think through his project and what he's doing. Um, and then the project summary abstract is more like a scientific abstract. So you're writing more to other scientists, giving a little more details. That's why it's longer. Then I also told you about, I think it's the next slide, the specific aims. Um, the specific games is not just an abstract, but it tells you like all the things in the grant. So it's also going to talk about your career development activities. Um, and that's part of the grant. Okay. Facilities. Lucky you. I, <laughs> we already have facilities for Baylor pretty well set up. And this is the link to it. Um, it's updated regularly. And it, it's very long now. You start at, it says two pages. It's not two pages. It's like 30 pages. Because there's so much stuff here and people use different things. So you take the basic facilities, you pull out the part that works and facilities means like your equipment, your lab. Um, maybe you work at the biosciences center. Maybe you work in the physical, you have a, what's the physical exercise place? Oh, the behavioral medicine laboratory? Yes. 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 And I, so I have all language of all those things 
that's taken basically from Baylor information that's either on the website or has been got I've gotten specifically from faculty members. So the part you'll also need to do is to personalize it, like whatever your office space is, whatever computer you have, any of those basic things that are unique to you, whatever equipment that's in the lab you're working in is probably not in my template. And if there's something that you need that's not in that basic one, you can ask me because I have 40, 40, no, it's more than that, it's like 60 pages of other stuff that people have needed along the way. Okay, so this is the meat, and this will be about 20 minutes. I'll, I'll stop maybe in 10 or 15 minutes to see if there's any other questions. But this is the research strategy, six pages. Um, you need one page for significance. You want to tell a story. What is the public, public health program? Public health problem that you're working on? What are the strengths and weaknesses of previous research? What's the critical barrier? What's the gap? And how will your training and research help you fill that gap? So you're looking in a little bit more broader perspective, like in my life goal, I, I go with Dr. Gandhi, my life goal is to understand how stress really impacts our cardiovascular health. Is that relatively yeah. close? Okay. So we want to find some different measures for that. And I want to have this specific training so that I can be able to explain better how it really impacts our health. And then maybe, of course, try to find some strategies where people can either lower their stress or better help their health. So significance, tell that story. Um, I will tell you something that I, I have to say sometimes when I read a grant is that it's not enough to just have a gap that we don't know about. It's important that we need to know that information. There's all kinds of things we don't know. I mean, I don't know why that tree is green and the same tree over there is not as green. Um, it's sort of more brownish, but I'm not sure that that's important for anyone to know. <laughs> you know, so think about that um, as you're trying to figure it out. You want to, and it's not that uh, I frequently, when I'm getting this in a, in a grant proposal, it's not that it isn't significant. It's they haven't told me. They haven't told me why we need to know that. Then innovation, especially I think on these grants, they want you to be an innovative person who has techniques that are unusual. You know, why is this particular combination of things you're going to do going to make you an innovative person, Some, something who push the boundaries, um, who's going to shift the way we're looking at a problem, provide some different methodologies or instrumentation, and then approach. Um, this is how you're going to do it. This is like, what are you actually going to do once they give you the money? <laughs> and this is actually, the, all of these are ones where I see them getting dinged in a uh, proposal, but frequently the approach um, if you can do a submission and then get feedback and do a resubmission, the thing they'll probably help you with the most is approach. And actually, I tell people, sometimes this is really vital. I saw this actually in a recent grant I was looking at, is some of the feedback they got from experts showed them that their plan had some, uh, may not work. You know, they may not work. They really needed to do this and this, this other test, or this other... And so that's actually a great value of a, of a grant proposal because it actually gives people who've done work and may have expertise that's beyond yours or different than yours can look at what you're going to do. And before you start doing it, before you find that out that it doesn't work, they're going to tell you that. So um, I really think that that's another value in actually proposing something. And um, you're also, this is other kind of, this is kind of the tricky part in this grant and the K grant. How do you explain the relationship between what you're doing with your mentor and then how you're actually having your own program? And that's a little bit tricky because they want to see that you are going to become something. So the other part of it is your information about yourself. Another six pages. Six pages is not very much actually to put all this in. You have to show you're committed to developing a particular research skill set. And you also have to show that when you do your mentor letter, you have to show they are committed to you doing that and spending the time to develop that. And sometimes that can involve maybe maybe you're going to spend some time in somebody else's lab. It could be here or it could be even another place. So that would be something obviously you're going to have to work out. Um, and hopefully your mentor would be on board with that because if you get some experience at this other lab, say in San Antonio, spend a month there, and then you come back with that experience, then you can add that to their lab. And then there's three parts of this particular one. There's your background, your career goals and objectives, which are really like, they want to know what your long-term goals are as well as your short-term goals. And then your plan for developing to be ready to be that faculty member to get that tenure track job. The specific gates, that's the one I was talking about before. That's the other kind of abstract. 
Um, and it's basically, like I said, you can't, some people start with this, they kind of get the overall idea of what they're going to write, and then they go into their, their longer documents. A lot of times, if you've done that, you still need to, when you finish that, go back and see if that actually matches up. Because actually, I was reading one before, and I said, gosh, there's all this stuff that I was making comments on. And then I went to their real document and realized it was all there, but they never transferred it back. So the important part about the specific games is the way it is reviewed is, I don't know, there's 20 reviewers. Each reviewer is given six proposals that they have to read carefully. And then they're given the rest of the proposals, 80 or something, that they don't read carefully. <laughs> what they will read is the specific games. So there'll be a lot of people at the review panel. I don't know exactly how many it is, depends on the institute and how many people they can get to volunteer. Um, there'll be three or four people who know your proposal. They've worked hard, they've done all the reviews on it. Then the other people who are discussing your proposal haven't read it, or they could have because they have it, but chances are they didn't. So they've read this, they maybe glanced through it. Um, so this has to be really good. It has to really reflect it. It's really important. And our grant reviewer, Peg Atkinson, who's coming January, you're welcome to join that grant workshop. She will say that. She says there could be someone in her place that uses her materials. Um, she will say sometimes people spend 50 50% 50 of their time writing this. I don't know if that's always the case, but I think it's important that it's good. And I have a guy writing it. This is one instance where I have several examples. And also, I haven't put this in your packet, but I have a, their NIH um, has a bunch of different example grants, and I will put that in the postdoc packet where you just look at what somebody else's grant looks like. I find it good, helpful to see a, uh, an example. It won't necessarily be your grant, but I know they have some K grants for sure. Um, training and responsible conduct of research. Like I said, we just hired someone who's going to be preparing this, and that person will probably have some things together for you. It's just one page, which talks about how you're going to learn how to do these ethical, um, how to how you're going to make sure you're ethical in your scholarly activities and in um, how you're going to do your uh, societal impact. So probably that's something we can help you out with. Um, plans and statement of the co-mentors. Again, I have those templates that'll help you out. Letters of support. So there's two other parts. Good. I I'm going to get through this. Um, so you have your two big letters from the, the mentor, one, one or two letters or three, however mentors you have. And then um, you can have letters of support from other people that are going to help you. Like maybe you just have, you're going to learn one technique. It's only going to be, uh, you know, a short time. He's not really a mentor for you, but he or she, but you're going to have some collaborations or maybe they'll, they'll be, um, working with you as some part. And so they're, they're a supporter, even though they're not a mentor, and they wanna say, basically this is, yes, I am actually agreeing to do what the grant says I'm going to do, and I'm really supportive of this person. And that could even be like, sometimes that could be somebody that you've worked with in the past who may be able to help you, or it may be something, your mentor may have someone that's a friend of theirs that knows a technique that they wanna collaborate with you on. These are not required. It's only if it actually works and is important for you. And again, collaborators, contributors, consultants, there's specific reasons why you call them those different things and you can look that up. Um, description of institutional environments. Um, you have to show these different things. Again, it's just one page, you write it, and then it's going to be, I think there's a, a letter that the Dean signs that's about the soft memory. Um, you have to say it's a high quality research environment. We're at R1 University, so you put that in there. Who are your faculty collaborators? Like most of the fact, most of the departments you're in have a lot of other people that could be supportive of you, even if they're not necessarily specifically contributing to your grant. There, you know, we do have a lot of postdocs here, which was not true when I started my job. So you have a group of other people that you can collaborate with, other graduate students that you're working with. And so those are the kinds of things you don't hear. And again, I have a, a template that helps you with that. Um, this is the one I was thinking about. This is the written by the one page written, although you'll probably write it by the dean or department chair. Ideally, you'd have both of them sign it, you know, write it, and then something that they could both sign. Um, it says, first of all, they're going to confirm that you're eligible, and they may ask you to prove that, like whatever your certificates are or your visa. Um, it affirms their commitment. It agrees they're going to support you as you're looking for that tenure track job and agrees to provide all the things that you need for your grant. Um, reference letters. Now, this is kind of different. Uh, most of the time, you don't see these in NIH grants, but because this is a, 
a candidate grant, um, you're going to actually need like regular reference letters. And the tricky part about this one is you don't get to submit them. Um, if they have to submit them by themselves. And the heart, the tricky part about that is making sure they do it on time. Yeah. Has anybody had <laughs> that problem before? Yeah. So definitely someone, if you worked with a graduate faculty member previously, that would be a great person. They know your work. They know your ethic. Um, it, so it could be that these are from your previous university. It could be people here at Baylor that work alongside of you. Um, these are just like regular references. This is a wonderful person. They are going to do a great job. They're absolutely the most amazing person I've ever seen. And I always have a template for those, which this is the person that can particularly address what I would call our soft skills, like you're hardworking, you're showing up on time, you're a good um, working with other people, you're a good leader, those kinds of things. And I have a whole list of those kinds of words that you can pick out which ones work for you. <laughs> um, and now, uh, Blake has a whole bunch of, of different courses that he's listed of how you can develop some of those things. And oh, you need, it says you need, I believe you need three to five. And if you don't get at least three, I believe they won't accept your application. So that's the tricky part. I would definitely ask at least five people, right? Because you want to get at least three of them in. And you could, this is where you kind of hound them a little bit to make sure, give it to them early. And then they have to, you have to tell them how to submit it and make sure they put it in. Resource sharing plan. This is now, this is new, uh, not new, but um, the newest application guide that's coming out, this H group, they're changing this and making it more, it used to be like you, only certain grants required it, over 500,000. Now it's like everybody needs to do it and they're being more specific about it. Um, so I may have to change this a little. This is actually what's still in the um, K99 group grant thing, but they, um, it's basically how are you, whatever information you're going to gather, you need to make available for other researchers. You know, it has to be something that if somebody else could use your data to do some other work, it's available for them. We have a tool called the DMP tool, which helps you to write this. It may be that your faculty member already has one that they've written that is basically the plan for what you do in your lab, and that will be helpful too. Um, they're also, this is something where the librarians can help you. They, um, there's two of them that have specific training in that. If you go to this guide, it gets you their names and their emails, so you can talk to them about it. Other project, this is just really depends, like if you're doing human Subject clinical trials. Oh my goodness, there's just so much more you have to do. <laughs> you have to, how do you set up the clinical trial? But actually, now that I've gone through a lot of grants with it, I realize it's kind of like you learn how to do this. It's sort of the same all the time, and you just you know apply it to that situation. A um, very big deal that they've been working on is it's not only that, and, and, and as a female, I'm really glad that they're making sure that women are included. People of all ethnicities are included in, in trials. And then they also, the one that I think is a little bit harder is trying to include people across the lifespan, which means children through older people. Um, obviously, that does not work for all grants. Someone I'm working with does cervical cancer. So he had to say in there, people with cervixes, you know, uh, those are the ones. And we don't take people that, uh, that don't have that. So you, there are obviously ways that you're going to limit it that fits your particular um, situation of what you're working in. It has to be, in that case, you can only deal with women in a certain period of time when they actually have that as a problem. I think it's I think it's 25 through 65 where that's the, the main issue. So you don't have to actually include all peoples across all lifespan, but you do want to explain why. That's the key thing, is explaining why you're doing that particular group. Um, proposal submission, this is very big <laughs> in our department. I work with these people here in the, the cubicles next to me, so they get upset when we don't pay attention to this one. Um, they have deadlines. So even though the deadline of the grant may be December 1st, you have to have all the information to them 10 business days ahead. So like two weeks ahead. And if there's a, a, a holiday, you have to include that too. So basically by the 10th day, pretty much everything should be ready to go. Um, and then five days before, maybe there's just a little bit of changes in the narrative, like you realize that you got a reference wrong or something like that. And then three days around. The reason is, and I've been a part of this several times, sometimes a grant won't get submitted. People have spent hundreds of hours. Ah, that was me. <laughs> and at the last minute, we're trying to submit it like that day and some glitch happens in this one particular case we were missing information from someone who was in a meeting who wasn't responding to their text. And so 
it didn't get submitted. And that's just that luckily we submitted it the next year, but um, that's awful. And so they don't want that happening. They want to make sure your grant that you worked on so incredibly hard gets submitted. And that's why they have those deadlines. Um, data visual visualization. This is just a book that I um, discovered was available for free online. There's also, you know, because people reading your grant are reading lots of grants. And the big difference between a grant and a paper is if you're reading a paper, you want to read it carefully because it helps you with your research, right? So you might skip certain parts, but you're reading it carefully. It's, it's useful for you. But a grant, what they really want to do is figure out which are the worst 50% of proposals that I don't have to finish reading. <laughs> and so out of the door. So if, you, but if your grant looks beautiful, it has some nice graphs, you know, I think I'll read this one. I like this. It's looking better. Just the graphs will make it look better. I'm sorry. We're, we shouldn't judge things that way, but we do judge by the appearance, right? So um, this is just a particular group, but I also want to, I have this page because the Baylor Libraries has a data scholar program where you can learn how to do visualizations of different graphs. I took the program. I'm not a graphs person. It wasn't really helpful to me, but I do know it's there and I know they're good. And what's even better is Joshua Bean, who's the charge of this. He would probably help you with something if you just brought your stuff to him. Um, and so that's the link where you can learn about their stuff. Um, final tips. Um, this is something you do, I'd say, I think it's really important, is after, you don't have to do this ahead of time because they won't look at your grant for another few months. They have to wait who they're going to send it out to and stuff. But when you submitted your grant, then you want to look at your at what your pre, your web presence is, everything that's about you on the web, because they're like you. They're going to look you up when they're, you know, especially, actually, especially if you're competitive, they're going to say, hmm, I don't know too much about Baylor. I don't know too much about you. Um, I'm going to look you up. And so what you, what it looks like when they look you up, what your lab looks like, whether it looks like your professional, what your papers are is important. And so that's when I say, after you've submitted the grant, go back and look at your web presence, make sure your, your faculty member has a decent website and that you have a page on that website and then um, it links to your LinkedIn or links into your CV, whatever it is. So, and I have a guide that talks and gives some examples, some good ones. Um, here are some other resources. The one that I want to point out, there's the, oh, yeah, I have the link here. I didn't know I did that for the NIH conferences, which tell you all kinds of different things. But right here, uh yes this this is a book that Baylor subscribes to it is a very valuable book and you can download it and keep it forever just don't tell people uh, I did actually find that they have a previous version that somebody else uploaded that they didn't you know we can I give it to the people that come from out of town that aren't part of Baylor but we subscribe to that and it's a new faculty guide for competing for research funding it's just like all the basic information you need not I like this one because it's not just about a particular grant it's about like how do you become a person who gets grants on a, on a regular basis? And it really gives you a lot of good advice. It's a great book and it is free. Okay. And if rejected, it happens. Um, this is the key, you know, consider it a multi-year process. You get the feedback, you can improve, keep pushing. Some people just need to write a lot of proposals. I'm working with one person now. I'm super excited. I'm super excited because I, think he's actually going to get this first grant and we have worked through a lot of proposals of the same basic ideas and it's like it's going to happen um don't take it personally i mean the acceptance rate is 10 15 20 maybe um contact the program manager this is a key um if you don't get accepted make sure you go back to that same program manager or whoever you were referred to whoever took care of your study section and say hey um do you have any other information because usually the program manager doesn't do the funding, but they usually sit in on the meeting and they listen to things. And it might be that there was one particular thing everybody talked about. And even though it might appear on your reviews, it might not be that it's highlighted there very well. And that person can say, you know what? The thing they really didn't like was this particular part of your approach. Everybody talks about that. That's why you, that's probably the main thing you need to fix. And so that's really useful. Uh, plus, when you contact the program manager, you're developing a relationship with that person. And, you know, isn't this the case? If you work with students, I don't know if you do as postdocs but, or even undergrads or graduate students, the more you spend time with someone, even if you think they're kind of annoying, <laughs> you sort of get invested in them, you know, and you want them to succeed. So you're getting a chance to develop that. And then NIH panels are memoryless because you'll have different reviewers next time. And you have a whole bunch of 
how to evaluate reviews. I actually came up with a great system. It's in that guide. Um, last advice. Here are some other things. These are from other people more than you ever wanted to know. And then here are some other courses that I've written if you're looking for some of that stuff. So that was it. And I think I did it at three o'clock. I'm pretty proud of myself. <laughs> I just think I could get this at me. Are there some questions I can ask from anybody on that's online or anybody here from the room? On this or any other group? I'm, I'm the grant guru, so you can ask anything else. Have these slides being shown? What's that? Are yes, slides being shown? Absolutely. In fact, I was going to give you, I have a, I actually made myself a QR code. That's like big stuff yeah. for me. <laughs> but yeah, I realize you really don't want to look at this on your book. So um, I'll probably have him email it out. And then this is going to be made into a video. So you, you really want to watch this again, right? <laughs> it's really embarrassing to me because when I look at the OVPR videos, for some reason, mine pops up. The one I did last year is like, ah, that's me. Um, Yes, all the slides are shared. They're all on box and um, all the information is there. It's freely available. You can also, because you're a Baylor person, um, look at all my other, there's a bunch of other stuff that's out there too. So you're welcome to look through any of it. I'm very happy to have people use it. That's why I spent so much time making it. <laughs> any other? Um, Virginia, I had one question. Yeah. Can I help you? What? Um, okay. Yeah, Virginia, uh, I wanted to ask, like, if no, um, like, we are all like early career researchers. So uh, if we don't have no, uh, what to say, one uh, particular area still defined, okay, mm -hmm. if I have my past papers were in some other area, but now I cannot carry on that study in future. So in that area, so if I don't have that research papers and I'm something putting up a new idea so is that a drawback because uh, we are in like no early researchers so is it necessary I should have uh, no my profile also should support that particular topic or I should have a preliminary data necessarily that is an excellent question I really appreciate that because I think that's true for lots of people because you're working as a graduate student in one particular area with one faculty member who has one particular thing that they do, and then you move to a postdoc, and chances are the postdoc is doing something that's very different. Um, and so I would say that that's where you do what I do best, which is weaving a story. And um, you want to make it, it, you know, we want to explain. And, and, and the other thing is that all the people reading your review is are going to understand that process, because that probably happened to them too. Um, it helps. Um, since you were doing this at year three of your postdoc, by the time you get to year three, there's a very good chance you'll have at least one paper in this area, right? I'm thinking that's probably true, or at least have good preliminary data. And so that's how I would put it. And what you're gonna, and the other thing is what you're gonna emphasize in this grant in any career grant is your skill set, which can be transferred to lots of areas. And actually, I would argue that it's something you need to think about yourself as. There was one person here at Baylor who um I, I want to be careful what I say, but he dealt with one particular area that no one was funding because it was not really related to health. It was about it. It was he was dealing with a creature whose evolution did not actually relate to any human process. And his his mentor that he was working with, who was the world expert in that, had switched areas because no one was funding that. And this guy would not switch. He kept on going, and but no one's funding it, and he ended up not getting tenure here at Baylor. And so I would argue that the most important thing, and actually is what we would advise him, is take what are your skills that you know how to do? What techniques do you know how to do? What sorts of um, you know abilities do you have? And then those abilities can be applied to lots of different areas. And so that's how you would probably argue, is that these are the skills that I developed while doing this particular project. This is the person I've become. I've now switched to working on this project and developed not only new skills, but a new um, area of expertise or um, subject matter, content matter. And that's what I'm applying my skills I learned to this content area. And then actually you have to say, you're gonna do an independent project, which isn't gonna be exactly like your mentor. So you're gonna have to be envisioning what you think that's gonna be, which will be probably related to your mentor. But um, not exactly. I mean, there's there's only room for one person doing the exact same thing in most funding sources. So uh, that's just, does that help a little bit? 
Uh, yeah, Virginia, thank you so much. So uh, what I understood is like, if we are able to you know, state that uh, the kind of approach we are using, I am familiar with that or that is there in my skill set, that would be enough, even if yes. I'm switching the area. Yes, and remember that this particular grant is funding you more than the exact mm -hmm. research part, although the exact research part is, you know, okay. too. Um, okay. The other thing is that you... You won't really know till you get that, and and I'm I'm forgetting, but I know it's in my guide. Like I think most of what you're putting into this grant is what you're doing as a postdoc, right? Because that's what you know about. I I can't remember actually, and you'll have to check my guide. I think you have some part about what you intend to do when you become a faculty member, but I think it's not fully developed because you won't really know till you get there, right? That's a transition. Where mm -hmm. do you go? What department do you go to? What resources do they have? That's going to depends on you know kind of what what exactly you end up doing okay oh, I have one more one more question i had yeah. uh, like uh, now the the current whatever you know the research we would be proposing would be kind of you know uh, the research interest of our the mentor so it's not uh, no because that is the area of mentor what we are basically we are doing so um uh, know how to differentiate that like, i think so there is one section is what you said mentor research versus mentee so do we need to show that no the mentor research is different something from our research or it is how it is related or it is similar in the similar area so what we need to mention in that section that's a good point they assume as you're doing postdoc work that you're doing work that is related to what your your faculty member your mentor is doing um, but what they want this particular program to do is to give you training that will let you go in a somewhat different direction from where you're something they call what they call an NIH the independent researcher so that you're not just doing exactly what that person is doing but you have like your own direction that is the tricky part you You've listened carefully and you've thought carefully because that actually is the trickiest part. How can I do something which is, you know, related to what I've already done, takes advantage of what I've learned as a postdoc and a grad student, but is some somewhat different? And that's actually something you have to think about regardless of whether you do this grant, right? Um, where am I going from here? What is it I want to do in my career? And I honestly think it's very hard um, for almost anyone in any field because you worked really, really hard. Maybe it's a little easier in the humanities because you've kind of been doing your own project, but you've worked really, really hard and you're, you're following someone else's directions. But now you have to like think, okay, what's my own research gonna be? And it's hard to even have space while you're doing the research with your faculty member that they want you to do, to be thinking about what that's gonna be. Um, but actually a lot of faculty members have ideas that can help you that maybe they're never gonna have a chance to do, but they've always thought, oh yeah, it'd be really interesting if you did X, you know, here's something that maybe you could do. And that's, so that would use, use your experiences in talking with them. And then maybe also talking with other people in your department or other friends that you meet. The other thing is that's a really good way if you end up going to a conference of any sort or whether it's virtual or in person, that's a, a way to, to, you know, get ideas of other people and things that they might have done. And you can share your research and find out what ideas mm -hmm. have that. And of course, you can read papers and see that. That's another way to think through. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Those are great questions. And I don't want to keep people if you need to get going. Please um, leave it. Yeah. Have time for... Sure. I have plenty. <laughs> That's great. So, okay. So um, when I uh, propose a proposal when I write the proposal I always think of what I'm expert on and what my mentor expertise on and what Baylor has what my right uh, institute has so if I want to propose something for example I work on breast cancer I work on metastasis mm -hmm. but circulating tumor cells is another field which is really growing up so many of the cancer people have moved on mm -hmm. looking at the circulating tumor cells so, for example, if I want to do something on circulating tumor cells, but I do not have an expert on, either my mentor has. Right. But I would like to collaborate with someone who's mm -hmm. doing the same kind of work. Yeah. So, in that case, how do I convince my proposal saying that I could get a training on that particular lab and I could do so and I could design so and so experiment? Uh -huh. How do I convince, because I don't have expert on, I need to get a training and I need to 
a design and experiment based on my training. That is a perfect proposal idea. So if you've got the idea, that's exactly what you want to do. And you don't have to convince them, the reviewer. You have to convince the person who's going to give you the training that they're willing to do it. Unfortunately, this is the hard part. I believe you can't give them any money. So I wish you could say, I'm going to give you, you know, $10,000, just help me train. Um, there, there's a reason for that. They, um, NIH does not want this grant to fund your mentor. They want it to be for you. They want it all about your training. They expect a mentor to already be funded. And the mentor, if they're funded by NIH, will get credit for helping you. You know, if they can write it in their grant that they're helping you and that, that helps them get funding. Um, so the key thing was finding some way or someone who's willing to give you the training that you need. Your mentor that you're working with currently will probably be, if this is a hot area, will probably be interested in having you bring that knowledge back. So they will probably be happy to have you do that. If you bring some information and knowledge and techniques back to your lab currently, because that could be something useful for them. So you do have to convince your mentor, your current faculty member, to, to let you do it and spend the time on it. Um, and then you have to figure out somebody who's willing to let you do that. And the, ease, the other thing I would suggest as you do that is sometimes use whatever contacts. Now, if you're, if you're just recently came to the country, you may not have contacts here in the U.S. I, don't, I think that's what you said. Yeah. Um, your mentor might have some contacts, um, or you may just do cold calling of some people, you know, and that's, that's tricky. Like, how can you find somebody? I would suggest if you're, you don't have another contact, you're just trying to find someone, you look for someone that's within driving distance of Baylor is your best bet. And you probably can find someone either at San Antonio or in Baylor's, Baylor um, in Houston, you know, there's a lot of good, in the health area, there's a lot of good Texas A&M. Look for someone that does that and um, would be willing to let you come. And then you write into your grant, part of your training would be funds to let you go there and spend, you know, play, get a place to stay and, and all that. That could be part of the grant proposal. And then um, if you're doing, I believe this is correct, but please check more carefully. I believe like if it requires materials or money to do the experiments, you could probably put that in your grant. Like you can pay them for the extra work that you're doing there. Mm -hmm. um, and the other possibility is they may have a project where you could do, once you've gotten that training, you could do some part of it in conjunction with what your mentor is doing, maybe add something to what they're already doing. That would be ideal because then your, mentors, your mentor here is gonna really like you learning that. You can have some kind of collaborative project. So, and you know, the best of all worlds, if your mentor has somebody in mind that would owes them something <laughs> and would be willing to set up something like that. And so the biggest thing is finding somebody and maybe that's through reading papers. Maybe that's by looking on, on I spend a lot of my time. I've done this for several people actually trying to, faculty members trying to find somebody nearby to help them on a K award or something that, that would work. Um, I just, I just Google on somebody on websites like a Baylor College of Medicine and say, who does this? Um, I will say that there is kind of a, having known lots of professors who are on senior level in their careers, there comes a point where they, they want to train new people. I mean, then they enjoy that part um, and they wanna pass on what they're doing to the next generation. So you may, even though it's very uncomfortable sometimes to make those emails and you may get rejected on to be honest. Um, <laughs> But I would say that if you're persistent, you probably can find somebody, especially if it's a hot area. And especially if you would then be bringing, like you'll kind of be a little extra help to them along the way. So I don't know if that completely answers it, but hopefully encourages you to, to give it a try. <laughs> Anybody else have something? And you're ha I'm welcome to have you email any questions afterwards. I'll send uh, some links to Blake. We'll send them out to you guys. And uh, I'm always happy to, to hear from you. I'm really not supposed to edit grants from postdocs, but maybe if you came to my workshop, I'll help you a little bit. <laughs> I at least be willing to give you some, you know, look at your, your one pager that you're going to send off. And if I have any ideas, I'm happy to help you. So thanks. Right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye.